to the MDC Alliance press conference, which will be an address by the Vice President, Honorable Tendai Eti, on the state of the economy. We'd like to extend our profound uh, apologies for the de delay in starting. It was due to technical issues. Before we get into the formal address, a few remarks. Zimbabwe faces its worst economic crisis in more than a decade. All the economic indicators point to our economy being in its worst state since the hyperinflation of 2008 and 2009. However, the economic crisis is but a symptom of the broader legitimacy and bad governance crisis that pervades our nation. As you'll hear today in Honorable Beatty's address, the root cause of Zimbabwe's multiple crises remains a political gridlock anchored by a crisis of legitimacy emanating first from the November 2017 military coup and thereafter the flawed 2018 harmonized election. This has been compounded by four decades of destructive, predatory, and exclusive politics, which has created a society captured by a broken down social contract, a deep lack of trust, the alienation of the ordinary citizen, indifference, intolerance, and polarization. Members of the press, I've said before, and I'll say again, Zimbabwe is at a crossroads where we are faced with a battle for the soul of our nation. Democracy is not only under threat, but it's been bludgeoned by Zanu PF. This is why the nation is in a deep state of crisis. Our teachers are incapacitated. They are severely under-resourced. Hence, it's no surprise that schools have become the latest hotbed for the spread of COVID-19. This is unacceptable. In the new Zimbabwe, education will be a top priority because education is the bedrock of any successful nation. Without a strong education system, there can be no future. We urgently need to save our education, which has suffered deep neglect and chronic underfunding by a ruling elite that is afraid of empowered, independent, and free citizens with big ideas. The economy has stagnated as we endure the second highest hyperinflation rate in the world, beaten only by Venezuela. Workers and the informal sector have their wages badly eroded by poor policy making, flip-flopping, and economic maladministration by political elites who are meant to be governing. The interests and property rights of small, medium, and big business alike remain under constant threat. We have one of the highest maternal mortality rates worldwide. Our public health system is on its knees and faces a real threat of militarization. 8.6 million Zimbabweans face starvation. Corruption is killing us. Ladies and gentlemen, the call to action could not be clearer. As President Nelson Chamisa has said time and again, we must come together and form a united front to defeat ZANU-PF. ZANU-PF is afraid of elections, which is why Mr. Chinamasa unconstitutionally stated last week that the 2023 election is a foregone conclusion. Now we reject the sliding back of Zimbabwe into a one-party state. It is time for the citizens to fight back because ZANU-PF has destroyed Zimbabwe. We must remain engaged and refuse to be sucked into apathy. ZANU-PF must go. The MDC Alliance has no hesitation in leading the charge, which is why we stand here today, 
confirmed as the nation's only credible, democratic alternative and ready to win Zimbabwe for change. The big fights that the MDC Alliance has taken on, the fight for a people's government, the fight for legitimacy and democracy, the fight for livelihoods and a better life for all Zimbabweans, the fight against corruption, the fight in defense of the constitution and constitutionalism, all require unity of purpose among progressive forces. We have no doubt that the fight to win Zimbabwe for change, the fight for a better, brighter, and more prosperous Zimbabwe will be won, which is why we are championing the struggle. Ladies and gentlemen, we must return Zimbabwe to prosperity. We must revive the Zimbabwean dream. We must ensure nobody is left behind and that our great nation begins to work for the many and not the few. And so without further ado, I defer proceedings to Vice President Tendai Piti, who will present an address on the state of the economy. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the diplomats that are in the room. We thank you for coming to our presentation on the state of the economy. Uh, our friends from civic society, uh, members of the 40 states, we thank you for waiting for us patiently as we battled uh, with uh, technology. This is a review uh, of the economy of Zimbabwe as of the end of uh, October 2020. But in addition to being a review, we also offer a 10-point plan uh, on the way uh, forward. The theme of uh, this address is restoring and retaining Zimbabwe back to prosperity. Restoring and retaining Zimbabwe back to uh, prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is common cause that our country is arrested by a multitude of uh, crises. There is a massive dislocation and disequilibrium uh, in the economy. Uh, there is a broken down uh, of the social services and social delivery. If you look at uh, public health delivery uh, system, uh, you find a serious abuse of the hospital staff, whether it's nurses, uh, whether it's uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, doctors. You see the absence of drugs. You see an expon exponential depreciation of the social indices, the maternal mortality rates, uh, the infant uh, mortality rates, uh, to figures uh, that are worse off than 2008. We locate uh, these crises, the mother of this crisis as being the crisis of legitimacy that is arresting our country, a crisis that emanates from the military coup of November 2017, and that runs to... Can I have protection, please, security? Can I have protection? Why not? Can the comrade please excuse us? Why? 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 So can you allow me to allow me to finish? Who are you? 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 Why? 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 Why?
What's that? I'm asking, what's that? Do you know what is the data? Don't even know what is the data. This is not a party building. This is a public institution. You can't do that. I think these infractions on the democracy, the closure of political space, do not surprise us at all, uh, which is why at the beginning of the year, we had the high fives uh, that we came up with. Those high fives are part of the agenda, a narrative of the MTC Alliance of restoring and retaining the country back to prosperity issue of protecting the right to human dignity and the economic affairs of our citizens. Number three is the fight against corruption and the, and the protection of the country's resources. Number four is the fight for the protection of the citizens, particularly the encroachment of civic and political rights. And what we've just seen a few minutes ago uh, proves exactly our point that the citizen has to be protected organization has to be protected. And lastly, the issue uh, of uh, protecting the constitution and the civil liberties. So, in formulating uh, our economic uh, alternative and presentation, uh, we make the point, and by the way, we will distribute the entire uh, document uh, uh, after I have finished uh, uh, my presentation and we'll post this uh, on our website. Uh, we make the point fundamentally that the precondition of moving Zimbabwe forward is of course the resolution of the political crisis, the resolution of the crisis of uh, legitimacy. And this involves five key issues. Number one, there must be diplomatic pressure and advocacy. Number two, there must be dialogue under certain uh, circumstances. Number three, there must be structural reforms uh, in this country. Number four, there must be an implementation phase, an implementation mechanism, what we call the National Transitional Authority. Once those reforms have been implemented, the country must be free to go to free and fair elections. So reload is an inextricable part of uh, uh, my presentation uh, this afternoon. So on economics, the first issue I want to touch upon is the humanitarian crisis. We contend, ladies and gentlemen, that the humanitarian crisis is a crisis of leadership, is a crisis of governance, and that what we have experienced in the humanitarian crisis is in fact a manifestation of the lack of performance legitimacy. In other words, the reflection of the cluelessness of the lack of capacity uh, of this uh, regime. The statistics uh, are frightening. 8.6 million people have to receive food aid in 2020, which is 60% uh, of the population. What is also frightening is the number of children that are affected, the number of children uh, that have to be uh, uh, fed in the this site, the number of children that have to be fed which are around 3.6 uh, million uh, people. Uh, there is something that scientists refer to as the severe acute uh, malnutrition uh, or cell. This grew in 2018 by 0.2%, in 2018 by 1.4%, and in 2020 by 3.6%. The one figure that is really frightening is that our food production in 2020 will fall by 57% from a figure of 2.44 uh, metric tons of maize to about a million metric tons of, of maize. But what is uh, interesting is that the entirety of the sub saharan sub uh, region has actually increased output by 8%. So in the region, there's been a growth of food production by 8%. But for Zimbabwe, there's been a reduction in food production by 57%. So clearly there are many, many factors, which is why we contend that the humanitarian crisis that we face in Zimbabwe is essentially 
amendment. The same applies to COVID-19. The response of the Zimbabwean government uh, was a disaster. At the time that the virus and the pandemic hit Zimbabwe, we only had one case center, a new prepared uh, Wilkins uh, Hospital, which actually at the time did not have uh, 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 you know, proper medical uh, equipment in the form uh, of ventilators. And all of us remember the tragic narrative of young Zororo uh, 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 you know, Makamba. Uh, by the end of April, less than 9,000 COVID tests have been carried out uh, in Zimbabwe. And if you compare in percentage terms, we are the country across the globe, including Malawi, including Mozambique, including Swaziland, that have carried, have carried out in per capita terms the least number uh, of tests uh, on the globe, on the integrity uh, of the globe. In November of 2020, Simstad produced a price and income survey, PISIS, which made certain important findings. This is government, this is Simstad. And I'll just read to you uh, three important findings from the PISIS report to illustrate how deep and structural uh, COVID is caused in our country. So I'm quoting from the PISIS report. Less than half of the children who were in school before the COVID-19 pandemic engaged in distance learning following school closure. In rural areas, only one quarter of the children engaged in distance learning. This is frightening. 75% of our children have actually missed the intensity of the academic year uh, due to COVID. And only a small section of kids in urban areas, and I will submit that in the more portion urban areas, not in Highfield, not in Tsvaresekwa, but possibly in places such as HIS, such as uh, Islands, such as St. George's, such as Heritage, if they manage to help their children uh, engage uh, in the uh, distance learning or IT learning. Number two, there was also a considerable fall in household income since the onset of COVID-19. As 90% of households that operated only non-farm business reported a drop in revenue. So 90% of households in Zimbabwe have been uh, affected. I want to come uh, to the real sectors uh, of the economy. And so what, I, what I'm submitting so far is that the combination of the political situation, the combination of the humanitarian situation, the combination of COVID-19 makes an urgent case for the restoration and the return of Zimbabwe back to prosperity. And you will see when I begin to outline our 10-point plan, uh, the agency uh, of the, the situation. The Zimbabwean uh, economy is an unprecedented tailspin, suffering from massive headwinds across all sectors of the economy. In 2019, the economy will shrink by a staggering 12.5%. Uh, and what it essentially means is that we are back to depression economies. So if you look at the graph that uh, we have presented before, you will see that practically for all intended purposes, from 2016 onwards, the economy has been recording a sub-zero uh, growth rates. With the 2020, we project 2020 to be around minus 12%. 2021, contrary to the estimations of Minister Tony Mube in this budget strategy paper, we estimate a below a below zero uh, a, a growth rate. And the factors are primarily man-made. The factors are primarily uh, uh, as a result of incompetence and cluelessness. Now, that graph is very important. I read that graph the return to depression economies because the Zimbabwean economy is very cyclical. The Zimbabwean economy loves these booms and slums, booms and slums, booms and slums, which you see there, you see the, the caves. But Zimbabwe's slums tend to be U-shaped. So if you look at the slum, it tends to be, you, you see the shape of a cup, it tends to be U-shaped. What it means in economics is that if you are trapped in a U-shape, it means you fall down steeply, but it takes you a long time uh, to, to get out. Now, if I were to impose the graph of the Zimbabwean economics, of the Zimbabwean economy, since 1965, 
or since 1980, you will see these huge caps in economics, they are called Kuznet, uh, Kuznet uh, depressions. This is a situation where your economy has a tendency of going into these depressions that last for 11 to 15 years. So if you, if you remember the crisis last time, the crisis last time lasted from 2000, so 1998 to 2011, an 11 year period where the economy lost 60% of its, of its uh, uh, value. So that's a Kuznet uh, depression that lasted for, for 11 years. We put the brakes during the four and a half years of the government of national unity, but we are back again. We are back again into that, uh, into that gap. The typical crisis of depression economics is weak or low aggregate demand. So if you go into the shops right now, unlike 2008, the shops are full of goods, but people are picking two, three goods and running away to their cars or to their homes. So there is weak or zero aggregate demand. That's why goods on the shops are not, are not moving. The third characteristic of depression economics is, of course, excess capacity. Excess capacity in the form of unemployment. 95% of the people in Zimbabwe are unemployed, are unemployed. Excess capacity in the form of idle industrial capacity. The capacity utilization of the country is around 20%. If you go to the industrial sites, you will see factories that have got grass. If you go to Bulawayo industrial sites, you see factories that are being converted into churches. This, ladies and gentlemen, is depression economics. We have dovetailed and fast-tracked ourselves into a depression, but a depression that is fast-tracking itself into an economic uh, uh, recession. Now, the IMF in April 2020 produced a staff report of 2020, which was an indictment. The IMF is normally placid, it's very normally complicit. It normally plays around and, and sugars and butters and puts mascara, puts, puts makeup on, on, on dictators. It is desperate to look for success stories. But this is what the IMF said in their staff report of 3 April 2020. Zimbabwe is experiencing an economic and humanitarian crisis. High fiscal deficits financed by RBZ money creation resulted in severe microeconomic imbalances and market distortions. The governments that came into office following the 2018 elections adopted an agenda focused on macro stabilization. This was supported by a staff monitor program adopted in May 2019 but is now off track as policy implementation has been mixed. Progress on fiscal reforms was overshadowed by costly missteps. That's how they, so the disaster of Mutuli Nube, they euphemistically fed to them as policy missteps on monetary and forex market reforms, climate shocks have crippled <coughs> agriculture and electricity generation and magnified the social impacts of the fiscal retrenchment and current reform, leaving more than half the population food insecure. Protracted external areas constrain access to external official support, while additional commercial borrowing is worsened the debt overhang and likely complicated discussion on debt resolution. With another poor harvest expected, this is in 2020, growth in 2020 is projected to near zero following a sharp contraction in 2019, with food shortages continuing with no progress on clearing long-standing external areas. The authorities face a difficult balance of pursuing tight monetary policy to reduce very high inflation and fiscal policies to address the macroeconomic imbalances and build confidence in the currency while averting the crisis. This report of April 2020 effectively put a death nail to the staff monitor program. For all intents and purposes, the IMF, the World Bank, and all the IFIs, together with the development partners, the United Kingdom, the United States of America, the European Union, China, India, all the countries have effectively written Zimbabwe off. And they've written Zimbabwe off because of what they euphemistically dub policy mistake, which in our respectful uh, submission is a crisis of governance, is a crisis of leadership, it's a reflection of the broken down 
uh, social contract. So one of the things, and we mentioned this in our 10-point plan, one of the things that the government needs to do, one of the things that the authorities have to do as part of restore, restoring and retaining Zimbabwe back to prosperity is to begin re-engagement with our FIs in a bid to ensure that we clear our areas with the World Bank, about $2 billion, with the African Development Bank, about $560 billion, with the Paris Club of Lenders, about 5.4 billion US dollars. I've left out the debt that we owe to the African Import Export Bank. I've left out the debt that we owe uh, to the Chinese. Let me move very quickly to inflation. As I'm talking to you right now, Zimbabwean inflation stands at around 759% which is the second highest in the world after Venezuela. But inflation is a byproduct of two things. Number one is the maintenance by the regime of over ambitious money creation activities by the central bank. When you read our main paper, we devote a section to money creation activities by the central bank. Between June of 2019 and June of 2020, there is a broad money supply in Zimbabwe, M3, as economists call it, it has grown by a factor of almost 600%. What this means is that the Reserve Bank has been creating money through printing of physical money, the notes, but most importantly through the abuse of the RTGSC system. So all treasury bills suddenly were converted into local currency, into the RTGS dollar. But there was one treasury bill of US $360 million, which the authorities had issued to Kudata Kure Sekunda in January of 2019. So Kudata Kunda, or Kudata Kure being who he is, he forced the government to buy off that treasury bill in July of 2019 at paro market rates. So the treasury bill was 360 million. If you convert it to the exchange rate at the time of 1 to 10, it means the market suddenly found itself flooded with 3.6 uh, 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 billion Zimbabwean dollars, which were then flooded in Fourth Street and caused the exchange rate to collapse immediately. The rate moved, some of you will recall, from 1 to 7 to immediately 1 to 25. This is an illustration of what we mean by uh, adventurous money creation activities by the central bank. But from the example I've given you, you will see that there are in fact three drivers uh, of uh, broad money supply and are for drivers of inflation. Number one is of course the RPZ activities. Number two is corruption. Because the only reason why Sekunda received preferential treatment was because of uh, uh, you know, corruption. The third thing, of course, is an over-ambitious fiscal policy. The, this government has ignored the fundamental rule of economics. You can only spend that which you have, what I used to call, we eat what we kill. If you spend what you don't have, you create a deficit. And when you create a deficit, you have to monetize that deficit. You have to find ways and means of filling the hole. Oftentimes, that's where the problem comes, because extra legal means of monetizing the budget deficit come, like printing of money, treasury bills, and so forth. For these and other stories, visit our website www.263chat.com. Follow us on Twitter at 263chat and like our Facebook page, 263chat.